Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Read and Write with Natasha. I'm very happy to have with me today uh, Sam Tiara who's a professional who has created a personal journey as a speaker, storyteller, writer, educator, mentor, coach, entrepreneur and a problem solver. His goal is to engage individuals in their personal and professional development, work with teams and organizations and nonprofits on alignment. He is the author of the autobiography Lost and Found. So uh, Sam, so happy to have you here with me. How are you doing? Uh, thank you so much, Natasha. I look forward to being able to be here and sharing stories and insights and, uh, you know, for your audience. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I finished your book uh, I, in one day. It was it was great. I couldn't stop reading. I really wanted to know more about you and the journey and what happens at the end. So um, no spoilers. So Sam, I'm going to uh, ask you to tell the audience, uh, the listeners and the viewers, what your book is all about. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So Lost and Found, Seeking the Past and Finding Myself, the title is very <clears throat> descriptive of, of the journey because I was born in England, raised in Canada. My parents are from Fiji Islands and my grandparents and ancestors come from India. Visibly, I look Indian and it's very common for people to ask, <clears throat> what part of India am I from? And I said, well, I was born in England, raised in Canada. They're like, no, 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 your parents, what part of India? Well, my parents come from Fiji. And they're like, are you Indian? So I'm like, well, my grandfathers are from India. And it was always interesting because then, you know, there, there are other times where they'll say, no, no, really, where are you from? And I'm like, let's start with planet Earth. I'm from the Earth. <laughs> and then others who look at me and they're like, yeah, you're not Indian. You're Canadian. <laughs> and wow. it's like, I grew up you know, unsure of my ide cultural identity because of this. I mean, like I said, visibly I'm Indian or South Asian, but uh, growing up in Canada, I mean, typical, we play hockey, eat hot dogs, we fall down, scrape our knees and we bleed maple syrup. I mean, we're Canadian. <laughs> but then I think, it, 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 you know, growing up in, in um, the Vancouver where I'm from, back then it was predominantly white and uh you know you you start feeling and and you are canadian and you know you do everything and i just remember you know getting you know growing up in that society feeling canadian and and you know walking around doing what you do and i remember in grade eight in high school i suddenly got hit and knocked to the ground and the person was and i said what's going on he said well i don't like indians i'm like but i'm canadian he said no you're not and it really, you know, and I know that a lot of people struggle with that cultural identity piece. They're trying to be Canadian. They're trying to be their uh, original culture. And it's only when I got to university, I got into a much more global audience. And now I'm interacting with people from all around the world, but especially people from India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, and they're sharing with me their cultural identity. And I'm like, what am I missing here? And, you know, then I started, you know, spending more time in that environment with them, you know, trying to realize, okay, so there are these, these cultural celebrations. What's the significance? Uh, eating more of the food from that region. So I, I started feeling this gap. The other side of it is my grandfather left India, you know, back in 1905, and he left India under some circumstances where he maybe had a disagreement with his family. Well, you know, he hopped on a ship and he, he and his best friend were on their way to Argentina, but the boat stopped in Fiji. He got off. We're not sure exactly why he got off, but it might be one of three reasons. Maybe, you know, coming from a landlocked part of the country of India, he was tired of sea life. And he just said, that's it. I'm done. I want to get off here. Or maybe he just saw Fiji for what it is, this beautiful paradise. And he said, no, I think I want to get off here. Or the third reason, maybe 
he thought this was Argentina. He got off the ship, the ship left, and he's like, wait, this isn't Argentina. And it's like, no. He's like, okay, I guess I'll make my life here now. So we're not sure. But uh, that's where then my father was born and my mom, you know, he married my mom, they moved to England. And then from there we moved. But one thing was that we were always disconnected from our village in India, our ancestral roots. And I guess when, you know, a number of years ago, I thought to myself, I'd like to go on this journey. To Part of it is to explore a country that, you know, I should be more familiar with. But equally at the same time, maybe see if I can locate our ancestral roots. Now, the only thing we had was the name of the village. We sort of understood that it's about five or six miles away from a town because my father recalls writing, you know, uh, popping the mails, mail uh, letters in, uh, to that town, which was about five, six miles away from the town, the village. And it sat in this one district called Hoshiarpur. So, you know, I thought, okay, maybe I'll, I'll head up to India, to Punjab and the region there to try to find this village. And um, my grand, uh, sorry, my, my dad's older brother had been to the village many, many years ago, but he passed away without us realizing where this village was. But mm -hmm. the only thing I had was a faded photograph. It's about a three by three faded photograph with people standing in front of a house, some people in the back. And it's a three and a half by three and a half dingy photograph of, of people. And that's all I had to go by as well as the name of the village, town and district. Well, a day before I left for India, my step cousin in Fiji said, look, I made it to the town but the name of the village is not correct. The name of the village is something else. It sounds like it. So the name of our village is Chadodi. He said the name of the village is Janodi. So I thought, okay, Janodi, Chadodi, it sounds very similar. Now there, I went online and there is no Janodi, but there was a Jandoli five, six miles away from the town. Chadodi, Jandoli, thought, okay, this must be it. Armed with a photograph, took off to India to explore, to experience. And I guess the essence of it was, I was a foreigner going to a land that shouldn't be foreign to me in search of a needle in a haystack and not even sure where the haystack was. That's the essence of what Lost and Found Seeking the Past was all about. It's, it's a fascinating story, especially that you only had a, a picture to guide you through. Uh, I'm not going to ruin it for, for the readers to see if you actually found the village or not. Yeah. Um, I'm going to keep that secret to see. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, um, I just want to talk about the process of writing the book. Sure. So one thing I noticed is the details mm -hmm. of, of the story. I mean, I'm assuming the story like maybe uh, it happened 20 years ago, I think, when you took that trip. Uh, it was in 2004. Okay. So um, almost like 18 almost years ago. Almost 20 years. Ago. And you wrote that book in, let's say, 2018. As well, it published, published in 2018. So it's 10 years after the trip, you wrote the book. Mm. And the details of the trip are like so vivid. So like mm. you have details of, you know, going back to the hotel, you describe how the bed looked when you took a shower, you know, the, the status of the bathroom in those restaurants in, you know, and you know, how, how you were the smell, how you felt, how the driver looked. I mean, I cannot remember what happened yesterday, honestly, um, but, and I, and I know that you mentioned that you had a journal, you know, yes. that you wrote some thoughts. But to what degree those details that right. you managed to capture, I'm like in awe of the level of details that you, you managed to capture. So I'm just curious to see yeah. how you managed to capture all these details 10 years after your trip. Right. No, and, and you're right. I mean, it's, it is uh, to some extent difficult in that regard, but there is something that, uh, that I did. Part of it was the journal really was important for me because I call them memory triggers the things I wrote in there. So then when I wrote it and I go back and I read it, it's a memory trigger to that experience. And the best way I could describe it is in, um, 
it was in 2011, I did a TEDx SFU talk, so TEDx, on storytelling, on discovering the extraordinary in the ordinary. So what I've always said is embedded in the ordinary as we see it, are these tremendously extraordinary experiences. So for me, I always travel with that mindset and the way that I, I sort of dissect it is through a concept I call CARPE. So CARPE stands for Curiosity, Appreciation, Reflection, Perspectives, Experience. What all of that combines is the enabling me to capture all of this information. So what uh, CARPE, so in that was in 2011. So 2004, I went on the journey, but then I started reflecting because I had my journal and I started again, reliving and experiencing the, the travels. So curiosity, we go through life, curiosity always stops me. Curiosity is this idea of, you know, what's around me? And rather than just walking through or just saying, okay, this is the way it is, curiosity says, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to, you know, look at this. And then I appreciate things for more than what they are. And the way that I appreciate it is I reflect and I add purpose and meaning to things. And P stands for perspectives. I mean, then we all have our perspectives and I build that in. But Natasha, the, the critical thing is experience. Experience is capturing that as an experience and not losing it. So this is where those memory triggers back in 2004 and writing the journal enabled me to all of a sudden relive it all through that carpe principle. And, you know, the sights, the sounds, the smells, all of that just becomes very vivid when you go through that. But it is all about that curiosity, appreciation, reflection, perspectives, experience. Now, had I have done the carpe before going to India, mm. I think even more depth would have happened, even though you saw that there is depth and uh, experiences and senses and activation of your senses. Uh, I think the story has helped me to realize that carpe principle. Yeah, I mean, I felt I was there, honestly. I mean, mm -hmm. I was with you every single day, you know, mm -hmm. when like there was a car accident, when, you know, the mm -hmm. you, you drank the shy and it was very sweet, you know, mm -hmm. when the, the the gulab jamu, you know, that's sweet. And I, I love gulab jamu, that's sweet. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was with you. I was in India step by step. I've never been to India, but I felt I was I was there. It was just fascinating. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about journaling and the art of yeah. journaling. I've, I've been kind of dabbling with journaling on and yeah. off. And I just get distracted. I forget to journal. You know, I have three kids. They're always shouting, you know, like I, I can't focus on that part so are, do you still journal and how important is journaling in the the self-development journey and for mm -hmm. writers and, and storytellers yeah no uh, so i i switch from journaling to blogging so on my mm. website i have about 185 blog posts and those are experiences thoughts insights that just come to me and I start writing and then I'll post it out for the world to see. I feel it's very important because again, I think it's very simple and straightforward for us to just go through life. And one of the things when I'm mentoring and coaching, it's not about what you do, it's about who you are. So whether I'm in class teaching my, my students or I'm mentoring someone one-on-one -on -one or speaking at a conference of professionals, I always say it's easy to tell me what you do, but can you tell me who you are? And many people struggle with that idea of who am I? And, you know, this is the, I think it's very important because, you know, when you know who you are, you know, thoughts and ideas come. Well, you can either have a Word document or, uh, you know, you could have a, a book handy, you know, that you could just jot your thoughts and ideas. And, Oftentimes people think, okay, but do, does it have to be long? It doesn't have to be long. And that's why I said like in my, in my journal, when I write something down, it's a memory trigger. So when I go back and read it, it's, it's vivid. It's very uh, uh, in place for me to then think deeper about it. And the reason, Natasha, why I think that journaling or blogging is so important is it's literally like pearls on a string. Mm -hmm. 
because they're not independent thoughts and ideas of each other, but rather strung together, there's something of significance here. Mm -hmm. So I often say that, you know, when you journal, what you're really doing is talking to yourself. Now, I mean, I've mentored and coached about 5,000 conversations to date. And it's wow. always, <laughs> no, I mean, I do three to eight per week. Oh, um, you can mentor me then. After there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, we do have some common, common <laughs> pathways and experiences yeah. that we can always share. Yeah. But oftentimes when I'm mentoring and coaching people, uh, it's all about the journey and and I'm asking all these questions of them and yeah not a lot of people will journal but even if you write down some key elements of it then there's some significance into your writing and capturing that essence of it it becomes that memory trigger now for me it's a little bit straightforward I mean the way I look at it is uh, I've mentored and coached all of these people Natasha do you know who my mentor is no who me I oh, self -mentor. Well. <laughs> well I my writing is how I self-mentor myself because I my thoughts and ideas this is how uh, ideas are activated this is how my writing is activated this is how I suddenly will uh, interact with myself and have these internal conversations and that becomes either a blog post or an idea for a workshop that I want to deliver I mean for example as I said with self uh, mentorship you know, I remember, again, thinking about it, saying, okay, COVID-19 is prevalent. Every single person in this world has been impacted by it. And I said, okay, but, you know, how do we move forward from this? And then through my thoughts and ideas of things I've written, and I, I, I suddenly came up with this idea of, well, there's a need for us to care. But what care stands for is collaboration, adaptability, resilience, and empathy. So, you know, collaboration, like I have something to contribute. You have something to contribute. How do we bring it together? And that's where the magic comes when we collaborate. Adaptability means don't be afraid of and fear change. Change can be amazing. And I embrace change. I embrace ambiguity and uncertainty, which is a place a lot of, a lot of people are not comfortable with. If I wasn't comfortable with being adaptable, I'd never have a book, I'd never be speaking, I wouldn't be teaching today. Resilience is this idea that no matter what happens in life, you keep going. And mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be rejections, there's going to be setbacks, but you keep going, that's resilience. And empathy, let's show more care and compassion to each other. I mean, it's something that's desperately missing in society right now. And all of that came out of just some thoughts and ideas of journaling is this concept of care and how we need to care. So do you think blogging is a substitute for, for journaling? I mean, can you be mm -hmm. as open with your thoughts and as, you know, like maybe private mm -hmm. thoughts sure. is you, you think it's, it, it, you know, it can be a, a good substitute because some people might not yeah. want to share their private thoughts to the public and they want to yeah. just keep it in a journal. Yeah. So oh, no, of course, I mean, uh, there are some people who uh, actually have gone through some very difficult, challenging times in life. And they do want to share, and mm. they are willing to be vulnerable and putting it out there. And yes, there are people who are like, well, no, that's really personal. Or if I write this, it's going to negatively impact, you know, somebody that, uh, you know, and yeah, then I think it's more discretionary. Mm -hmm. um, you can write it, even if you created a Word document, but you never sent it out. It's very much like, um, you know, there are times where we might write a letter and uh, we write a letter to ourselves, or we write a letter to someone, but you never mail the letter. The idea is that, you know, you just put your thoughts and ideas down. And I think that's where it's really important, no matter how you do it and whatever you're comfortable with. Um, it's also you know, I remember when I wrote my first book on personal storytelling. In the very beginning, there's something I wrote that said, there is fear in me in writing this book because of what people may think. In other words, judge me. The bigger fear is, what if I don't do this book? That's the bigger fear in my life. I need to get my thoughts and ideas out there. But to your point, I agree. Like, there are 
times where maybe there isn't something we should be sharing. So that's okay. You do it as you feel. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you mentioned something about you think everyone should write an autobiography. I think I read it somewhere at the end. Can you please elaborate on that and why you think we all should write our own story? Some people, um, so for example, I, I work sometimes as a ghost writer and, you know, I talk with uh, businessmen and people who yep. want to write their stories. And then they say, I'm not sure I have anything to say. You know, I, I don't think anyone is interested in my story. So right. what would be your answer to this? And why do you think yeah. anyone's story is worthy of documenting? Well, and it goes back to uh, a quote that I live by. Everyone's life is an autobiography. Make yours worth reading. And it's a, it, it doesn't mean you have to go out and do dangerous things. But the idea is every single one of us is an autobiography. We're, our lives are pages of the book, chapters, sections of things that we've experienced. And I think it's more um, a sentiment rather than they have to write it. It's a sentiment to say that you are a living story and your story is worth sharing. Uh, tell me about where you've traveled. Tell me about your upbringing. Tell me about your ancestors or your parents and how they got to this country from wherever. And, uh, you know, any of those things. And I think when, when you dig down deeper, you suddenly start to realize, well, you know, this is what happened, that happened. But to your point, it's true. People say, yeah, but who's going to be interested in my story? Uh, I always say that, you know, if you decide that, you know, maybe, you know, you want to self-publish it for a legacy piece for the close immediate family members, just something that becomes a legacy piece. Well, then write that. And it doesn't have to be the next bestseller. It doesn't have to be a, a, on the table for a literary award. But think of it this way, you know, how many generations are going to pass before you are erased from society? Like, in other words, you know, you know, my my grandfather, he's probably about four generations before, you know, now he may no longer exist in people's minds, except by writing this book, Lost and Found, he's there for perpetuity now. Uh, there are a number of self-publishing sites where, you know, there's no cost to writing your book and, you know, it's all print on demand. So if you wanted to do a legacy piece for your family about how you got here, how your parents got here, you, you can do that. And it, again, it doesn't have to be this literary piece. It's just something that's for you and for some of your close people as well. But everybody is an autobiography. Fascinating. So, and this brings me to the question about your publishing journey. So, did you self-publish this? Because I see a name yes. of a publisher, but you owned the uh, the, pub yeah. the publishing house. So, yes. if you yes. if you can tell us a bit about your publishing journey, do you, sure. do you have an agent? Did you self-publish yep. so that we can help other aspiring uh, authors and writers in, in their publishing journey? And that's a very good question because it's almost like I've. I've had the experience of the spectrum. So the way I describe it, my first book I wrote on personal storytelling, that one is self-published. Lost and Found, I, I, it's a beautiful story that needed to be shared. And I thought, no, I, I wanna see if I can get an agent. But I was able to discover uh, another model, which is I called a hybrid model. So here's how I describe it. The agent, you're probably going to be rejected. You're mm -hmm. going to have to knock on a lot of doors. And, you know, they're looking at it as how many books can we sell? If we can sell 50,000, 100,000, et cetera. Yeah, then we'll bring you on. Self-publishing, you're doing it all by yourself. So think of it as building a car. With an agent, if you went the agent route, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm helping, but they're building the car. They're going to drive the car. I'm in the back seat, and I'm not sure where we're going to go, but they're going to be driving. Self-publishing, well, you're going to build the car all by yourself. There's going to be parts and pieces missing. 
You're going to be driving the car, but you're not sure which direction you're going. That's self-publishing. The hybrid model is working with a company. I use Page Two uh, Books, amazing, amazing uh, organization. And what they do is they're going to work with you to build the car together. You're going to drive it, and they're in the front seat helping you guide the direction you need to go. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if, and I'm glad I went the route of self publishing first, and then I went through page two. I tried agents, but I, you know, after 50 rejections I, or 50 proposals, 25 rejections, 25 I never heard back from. I'm like, mm, okay, let me move on to something else. And then I found page two books and I was like, oh my gosh, love it. And uh, that's where I'm glad I did the self publishing journey first because it got my feet wet. It allowed me to experiment, to understand the, the literary journey so that when I did page two, sorry, when I did page two and lost and found, it's my magnum opus, the, the lost and found book. Magnum opus meaning it, it's my life's masterpiece in writing. Will mm. I, will, nothing will ever be better than that book, but does that mean I'll never write again? No, no, I will still write. But my heart and soul was just poured into that book in a way that, uh, I would say it was so beautiful when I wrote this book and I, uh, and it was an arduous journey, but the, that's how I would describe the writing part is self-publishing agent and uh, hybrid. The challenge though, is many authors, and I never had this sense and feeling many authors think I'm going to write this book. And you know what, because you've embedded yourself into it, all of a sudden they think this is the, story that's just going to be the next bestseller yeah i'm sorry there's so many books out there there's so many people writing that that's not the case don't write because of notoriety status or money write because it means something to you mm -hmm. and i also tell authors you know there's two parts and one is this part you didn't even anticipate it's like being slapped on the face with a raw fish on your head like this go after you've written your book the idea is, you know, you spend all of this time in your life writing this book and it takes time. And it's difficult. And when that book arrives and you hold it in your hand, it's an amazing feeling. But it's short lived because once that book arrives and it's in your hand. Now, part two, this is where the fish slap happens. Now, then reality comes. It's like, <laughs> wow, now the second part of the journey is getting the book out there. Yeah. And that's so difficult. It's like pushing a boulder up a hill. Yeah. And, you know, you've got to do a lot of work yourself. And, uh, you know, but but it's important. I mean, will this book be the next bestseller, travel, etc.? Who knows? But you know what? It's a beautiful story that just needs to be shared. And now actually, so there's an audio book to it. I just recently finished the screenplay. So now oh, I'm wow. making the book into a screenplay. I hired a screenplay writer because I have no idea about screenplays. And um, we're going to push it out to see if there's a potential to make this into a movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I, I can see that, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and so you sent me the book, so thank you very much. And you had something inside the book, and it was a piece of puzzle. Yes. And why did you put that piece of puzzle in the book? What was the message that you were trying to send? Right. I, and I think it's actually a very important message uh, that, again, it goes back to that concept of care, collaboration, adaptability, resilience, and empathy. So I've given about 5,000 puzzle pieces to date. And again, it goes back to that idea and thought of the extraordinary in the ordinary, because... Natasha, what I did was I gave you one single piece of a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, you yeah. have it, but it's different than this one. The reason yeah. I do this is because, you know, this is what people feel like. They feel like that single piece of a jigsaw puzzle. They don't know where they fit in. They don't know what the bigger picture of life is. But this is what they feel like. And it's ordinary. So right before your eyes, I'm going to transform this from ordinary into extraordinary. And the reason I say that is because instead of thinking about this, here's the satchel. My 
my, the, the puzzle came out of. If I give you a single piece of a jigsaw puzzle, do you realize my puzzle cannot be complete without you? Do you realize how important you are to my life, to my puzzle? Mm. That's what I remind people. And I've given 5,000 pieces in the world to remind people how important they are. Because, you know, I think we go through life just doing, but we don't realize the impact we have. So with the 5,000 pieces, I've got people who have taped it to their mirror and they said, it reminds me every morning, someone told me I mattered. It's traveled in backpacks around the world. It's in wallets. And, uh, you know, I see pictures of people with their wallet here and the puzzle piece. And they're like, Sam, you're still with me after all these years. Or in curio boxes of their most prized possessions, little boxes. And they said, nope, your puzzle piece is in a safe little place. It's also so important because I've had people tell me that they've gone through the most challenging, difficult times in their life with mental health issues. In the deepest, darkest moments, they saw the puzzle piece. Now that did not get them out of depression, but they just held on to it. They said they've held on to it because it reminded me where it came from. It reminded me that I'm part of your puzzle and it hmm. was that important to me. So it's a simple thought and idea, but it carries, it carries yeah. so much purpose and meaning. It's mm -hmm. very, I mean, and you came up with this idea. It's, it's beautiful. It is yeah. beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm going to steal it. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm going to make sure I keep that puzzle in a safe place. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I'm kind of tearing up now because uh -huh. it's, 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 it's very powerful. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that the journey that you took changed your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Tell me how yeah. that journey changed your life. Yeah, and and I think what we'll do is we'll leave whether I found the village or not as a as yeah as a, not a spoiler. <clears throat> but what I will share about the lost and found, seeking the past and finding myself, is I was able to realize my identity, and I think the importance of this part is so many people that I've talked to said they could relate to the idea that I provided. So prior to India, my life was what we call a tali. And a tali is a platter with segmented dishes. So I'm British, Indian, Canadian, and Fijian. So they're segmented and they're separated. But, you know, so if I go to, um, you know, an event and it's all Canadian sort of atmosphere, I mean, I'm Canadian. And if I went to a Fijian temple for a celebration of Hindu celebration. Well, okay, then I'm that. And I was always segmenting. But I had an epiphany when I was in, um, in India in Punjab. I literally woke up at 4am. And it suddenly made me realize that instead of a tali, a segmented, a platter with segmented dishes, I'm actually kichri. And kichri is a rice dish where you literally add vegetables to the rice and spices and flavor and it's a blend of flavors uh, it could be like a biryani it could be like an omelet but it all comes together and i think that's what it told me is the fact that we're all kitchery we're all a blend of flavors and to embrace them all and not segment ourselves yeah now mm -hmm. you're making me hungry <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and so Okay, so one of the things that I also wanted to ask is, do you now define your life as before the trip and after that trip? Is, is, it, is this how you see yourself now? Yes, I see myself as kitchery. And my goal is to help other people realize that they're kitchery as well. Uh, you know, and, and it, it did change me. I mean, there were many things on that journey that, uh, that helped make me who I uh, add in who I am. And again, the other thing that that resonated with me is the fact that, uh, you know, my wife is a tourist, and I'm a traveler. And it was something that became very evident on that trip, because a tourist, and there's nothing wrong with being a tourist, a tourist wants to go to a place and just see it, they don't want to experience it. So, you know, you'll get on a tour bus, and they'll take you over here and they'll say, okay, you know, you can, you've got 30 minutes to take your pictures. And then we get back on the bus and she wants to get back to the hotel, sit by the pool. And again, there's nothing wrong with being a tourist, but as a traveler, 
no, no, no. I want to experience. So I needed to walk the streets. I mean, on a different journey, I went to China with my best friend and he and I both wound up sleeping on the Great Wall of China in tents or going to Egypt and not just seeing the pyramids. I went into the pyramids of Egypt or, you know, swimming in the Dead Sea in, um, in Jordan. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to sit on the beach. I want to go in. I want to experience. And, you know, the vibrancy of this world has is what emerged out of this trip. And I'll just share with you this, uh, this quick quote that uh, I think really captures the essence of, of how I travel as a result. Travel isn't always pretty. It isn't always comfortable. Sometimes it hurts. It even breaks your heart. But that's okay. The journey changes you. It should change you. It leaves marks on your memory, on your consciousness, on your heart, and on your body. You take something with you. Hopefully, you leave something good behind. And that was by Anthony Bourdain. And I think yeah. that that quote really captured that I don't just want to go see. I want to experience. I want to build these relationships. I want to interact with people so that I have an opportunity to learn more about culture and society and, you know, go through life with an open mind. I mean, it was interesting because I went to numerous times to the Middle East. And I remember the very first time I went to the Middle East, uh, you know, people were like, you're crazy. It's dangerous there. You shouldn't <laughs> be going. And yeah. I'm like, they're like, haven't you seen the news? And I'm like, well, no, I'm going. So I, I landed in Kuwait and Kuwait is right next to Iraq. And Iraq was going through major upheaval. And they're like, you're crazy. Uh, I hope you come back safe. So after I traveled the region, not just Kuwait, but I went to, you know, all of the Gulf region and Jordan and all of that, I came back and people said, oh my gosh, like, so how dangerous was it? And I looked at them and I said, you're not going to believe it. It's extremely dangerous. And they're like, really, what did you see? And I said, no, I tried to cross the road. It was dangerous trying to cross the road. <laughs> And they're like, but what about, you know, terrorism? What about kidnappings and shootings? And I said, it's safer for me to walk around Bahrain at midnight than it is for me to walk around in Vancouver at midnight. Yeah. And they're like, really? But Natasha, there is something that I did experience that is extremely dangerous in the Middle East. And, and this one, it's, uh, I spoke at a conference, finished on Thursday, leaving on Saturday, uh, one of the conference goers, a wonderful young woman said, I'm going to pick you up on Friday and I'll give you a tour of Bahrain. I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. So Friday morning, she pulls up. And as I walk to the vehicle, she steps out of her vehicle and she said, Sam, I'm so sorry, but uh, plans have changed. And I said, well, that's okay. You go do what you have to do. She goes, no, no, no. You don't understand. My mom wants you to come home for lunch. <laughs> it's the food. <laughs> A, a Bahraini mother who's cooked all day with an empty plate sitting in front of you and she has the spoon. <laughs> you know this, Natasha, that's very yeah. dangerous. See, that's yeah. very dangerous. Like, you have to eat until you're stuffed. Yeah. I know. And my lesson yeah. to everybody as a traveler is <laughs> make sure you eat very slowly. Because <laughs> that's the trick. But that's the dangerous part of the Middle East. Well, in Middle East, but most of the world, when a mother sits across from you with a spoon and all this food, be very cautious. That's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. The food is like every time I go to the Middle East and come back, like I gain 10 pounds oh. in a week. They just keep <laughs> stuffing me with food. I and know. it's so good. <laughs> and dangerous, right? Yeah, it is dangerous. Uh, uh, so um, you mentioned that you work with people on alignment. Can mm. you please explain what alignment is? Because I'm sure. not quite sure what alignment is and if I need alignment in my <laughs> life. <laughs> well, whether it's an individual team or organization, when I talk about alignment, it means that, you know, oftentimes people are hired, they start their job and they work. But have we taken the time to really understand who they are? What are their skills? What are their strengths? And, you know, making sure that we acknowledge and recognize what people are capable of doing. And that's going back to not what, but who, and then getting them to realize, okay, so, you know, this is where, where we want to go as an organization. 
let these are the people, how do we work together to get to this point? So through uh, personal reflection, uh, experience, et cetera, experiences, and uh, you know, through assessments, we learn about the individuals. And then we say, okay, here's where we were, here's where we are, here's where we want to be. How do we collectively get from point A to point B now? So alignment is just about this idea of, you know, striving to, you know, bring everything together to realize how do we move this uh, on a journey. It'd be similar to going camping, for example, <laughs> and not realizing when you get there that, well, we don't have any, uh, we don't have a can opener and no spoon. Who was supposed to bring that? Well, no one asked anybody <laughs> because we don't know, right? Now we've got all this food in a can, but we can't open it. Well, maybe smash a rock on it. Then that's yeah. when I come in with the problem solving. Okay, let's figure how we're going to get this. But the idea is let's find out who's got the spoon. Let's figure out who's got the tent. Let's figure out who's got the, who's going to drive us there. And that's alignment is, is making sure everything is lined up. So doing an inventory and then progressing along to where we need to be. That's alignment. But isn't that like project management? Well, true. And project management, though, again, is are you really digging down deep to the point where you understand who the people are? Again, mm. to some extent, project management is here's what we need to do. And here's where we are. And here's what we need to do. And let's just get there. But let's I'm saying alignment means let's understand who we have. And what's the best way we can incorporate them into this to get us to where we need to go. Mm, I yeah. see. And do you think uh as a society we are lagging when it comes to alignment and yeah what I you mean, know what happens if an organization is is not aligned well yeah uh, you're not at your pinnacle best and okay. you know and and the idea is you know what is the potential that we have here so this is oftentimes where many of these conversations that i have and it's been about five thousand to date is to help people realize who they are so that they feel very comfortable. And, and you change through your career or life experiences. It's not just, you know, here's what I am. So like there are five things that guide and direct me in life, servant leadership, story sharing, activator igniter, champion enabler, and community do-gooder. But those have changed over time as I've had these rich experiences and I've changed my words, but I really understand who I am so opportunities come to me because of the fact that people know what I can do. Equally, at the same time, I get them to start saying, well, who are you? And what are the things you're not willing to compromise? What makes you tick? What, what is it that you're inspired by? And how do we get that into this job environment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back to yeah. the book and the journey. Have you ever been to India after that journey? Once, and that was a, a relatively short trip. I haven't been back, but I've been to other places in the world as well. Yeah. Was it different when you, after, you know, the second time when you went back to dinner, did, did you still feel like a, a foreigner or did mm -hmm. yeah. the second time you felt more Indian? I felt more Indian the second time, but it was different because when I write in the book that when I got to India the first time, and, you know, after going through customs and that door opens up and now you're walking out, it literally was a sea of people. And uh, you were just inundated with people and overwhelmed. But the second trip, they stopped people from being in that. When the door opens, there wasn't anybody there. And I'm like, well, this is different. They were all outside, <laughs> they were all outside the airport. But um, the, the second time, I don't know, it, like I've got two boys. The first time my wife and I had our first son, you're on pins and needle. You're not sure what it's like and all of that. The second time around, you're like, eh, okay, we've been through this once. <laughs> yeah. We know what to expect. So the second time I went to India, it was a little bit more of, okay, I know what to expect. And, you know, it was easier the second time, but I still enjoyed it as much as the first time. Mm -hmm. And what are your future plans now when it comes to publishing? What is, yeah. what is your... Are you going to write another book? What is what yeah. are you working on? I'm just curious. Yep. So part of it is the screenplay for this book. That's something that uh, we're going to work on and with my screenwriter. And we've talked to a couple of producers and they're giving us really great insights on um, how to make the story. It, the, the, the story is 
very well done as a screenplay, but they want us to make some changes. So that's screenplay. Um, from, a, from a book standpoint, I am going to be writing another book. Um, well, I've got two. One is a children's book um, on mm. leadership. Uh, and the other book is uh, a book that's more geared towards, you know, 15 to about 30, 35 year olds about, you know, their personal journey as they move forward through life and career. Uh, it's also a, a, a book for parents on educating themselves and how they can support the young people in their journey. Uh, and um uh, the other thing is my Instagram has a, a whole bunch of uh, quotes that I've come up with. Mm. And I think I want to make that into a gift book. Like it'll be a quote in big letters and it's, uh, you know, surrounded around the idea of curiosity, appreciation, reflection, perspective, and experience. So I've got some ideas. I just uh, have to find now the time to feed that in because the other part is uh, I'm still doing about 30, 35 speaking opportunities per year. But I'm also now focusing on per perhaps doing retreats, like a three, four day retreat, uh, you know, in either Costa Rica, South Africa, maybe in Kuwait or in the, in the region, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, so building out the retreats, uh, speaking on podcasts. I think this is about 60, 65 podcasts that I've spoken oh. on today. <laughs> Enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, just really doing what resonates and matters to me. Mm -hmm. So any advice to people who want to write their autobiography? Um, yeah. What would you tell them, you know, be before we conclude, because we're coming yeah. in uh, the hour? Sure. What would, you, what, what would you tell them? I would say open up a Word document and you don't have to have any semblance of order, but just start writing down some of the experiences and maybe watch the TEDx speech that I did in... Um, 2011. And that doesn't, I'm not asking people to do that because I want the numbers to rise up. I get nothing out of it if people watch the video. But I think what it does is it'll help people capture the extraordinary in the ordinary and not see what they've done as ordinary, but more extraordinary. But start opening a Word document and drop things into it as experiences and start writing and, you know, go back to it later on and expand on the story if need be. And then create a framework as well, separate document of, you know, if I wanted to write a book, what do I want to say in this? And, you know, how, what's the process I want to do? And then figure out, is it the self-publishing? It's really hard to get an agent or maybe a hybrid model, but mm -hmm. be careful with the hybrid models. I fortunately had a recommendation and it was an amazing recommendation, but there's many companies out there that just, yeah, we're going to make you into a number one bestseller, but you know, yeah. are they there for you or are they for, there for themselves? And usually it's for themselves. Yeah. I mean, the cover is, of your book is beautiful, uh, yeah. honestly. And I just kept looking at it. And uh, who did you hire to do that? Or was yeah. it part of the of the deal with, with the hybrid publisher? Yeah, page two. Uh, but, but, the, but what I loved about page two with the cover design, I, I agree, like it's, it is a beautiful cover. And um, their idea was bring us books that you like the cover of and let's sit down and have a look and brainstorm. And then when, when I was showing them covers and I said, I, I want the vibrant red, but it's got to show India to some extent. So they sent me different samples and then back and forth, back and forth, we agreed on, okay, this is the one that looks the best. And then okay. on the back, and even on the back cover, I, I needed the, the picture to be there with map yeah. and compass and then same thing, they said, okay, let's let's make it this way. But it was a collaborative piece. And that's the part I like is it wasn't them forcing it. It it was like us working together. And how is the book doing in terms of, of sales? Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if you yeah. were willing to share. Oh no, sure. I mean, that's the thing. So you you it's really hard to sustain the sales part of it. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because, you know, now my focus is on the screenplay and other projects and things I'm working on. So, you know, it's one of those things that I'm hopeful for that, you know, if this becomes a screenplay, it injects it, or I'm going to be uh, hiring a couple of my uh, students who are looking for opportunities and get them to, you know, build out a plan of how do we 
keep the momentum moving on the book. It's been doing pretty good. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. not the best seller yet, but equally at the same time, you know, I'm just happy if people read it and they're saying, you know what, this was a beautiful story. And I'm going to keep pushing it out there, keep uh, on that journey, pushing that boulder up the hill. It's um, and not have the boulder roll and kill me on the way, but I'm going to keep pushing that boulder up the hill. It it is a beautiful story, and it needs to be shared widely. I mean, I um, you know, I'll I'll do my part in you know telling my friends and my listeners Thank and you. everyone about it. And so, any any final thoughts before we conclude? You know, I think the final thoughts that I would share with people is the fact that um, your life and story is significant, no matter how insignificant you think it is. It is significant. Um, if it's important to you share it. And even if it's having a conversation with someone over coffee, uh, tell your stories. And this is why I say story sharing, not storytelling. Story telling mm. is me just telling a story, which the book, which you read. Story sharing is where you and I sit down over tea and, you know, we just engage in a conversation. Everybody's life is an autobiography. Make it worth reading. I'd, I'd love to hear people's stories. And, you know, there are significance in what people do. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, very moved by this conversation and I'm going to keep listening to it again and again. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be like writing an article about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Sam, for your time. This has been amazing. And for anyone who's listening or watching, uh, thank you. And uh, please make sure to check out Sam's book, Lost and Found. It's available on Amazon.com and Amazon uh, Canada. So yes. don't miss out on this amazing story.